Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Radically Loved Podcast. I'm joined by a very special guest. Lovey, you really are just probably one of our biggest guests, star guest, because I have talked about you on the podcast before. I've talked about your books before, and I just can't believe that we finally have you here at the podcast. Thank you for being here. I am glad to be here. So I know that you recent. I was just saying before we started recording, um, I saw that you were recently in Portland. I actually lived in Portland for four years and you did this big event, your first event since 2020. How was yep. it? You know, it was really cool. Um, it was a nicely vaxxed space and mass space. So I felt comfortable in that way because there were a lot of other events that I was like, I can't come to that because y'all have no COVID protocols. But it was great to get on that stage and get some energy. And it was in front of librarians who, like, frankly speaking, I think are amazing because they're enablers of knowledge. So it was really cool to get their energy. And it was like in front of 3,500 people. Yeah. How so it did- was cool. No, I love that. I think it's so great. How did that, how did librarians impact your life and your career? Yes. Like my first email address, I got it at the library, at the Harold Washington Library, downtown Chicago. I remember I was like a sophomore in high school and I went there and stood in line to use the, one of the computers and I had to go every, every Saturday. I'd go to the library. Like, you know, other high schools might've been kicking it. I went to the library on Saturdays. I'd go in the morning and come back in the evening because I spent all my whole day at the library. So for me, like to then get back to being on stage and it got to be in front of librarians was really cool. That's awesome. That that to me is one of the most important things that I feel that perhaps this newer generation is missing that experience of being in the, you know, that smell of those books, like being able to go to the library. How do you think that's affecting, what is it, Gen Z, I guess? Gen Z, and then Gen Alpha is underneath them. Wow. Um, I mean, again, like, I remember having to sit and wait because you'd have to sign up for a computer. And then you sit there as they're calling five people and then somebody else. And it just, you just have to wait until people are done. And um, how much libraries were like a respite for me? I've always been an avid reader. So, you know... The nerd in me always appreciated sitting there for, again, sitting there for hours without a cell phone, without any distractions. It's just me and the books or the me and the computer. I think it's amazing. And I think Gen Z, they don't get to experience, they don't have to because the world has moved past the point where you have to sit in the library because your phone can do everything I did at that library on Saturdays faster and more efficiently. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, but don't don't you think that has like a severe effect on our ability to be patient. So look, I love being able to get information on my phone like quickly, right? If something's not loading, I'm hitting that refresh button, like hurry up. Like why is it taking so long? You know, but I, I also do remember having to wait for a book to come back to the library that you wanted to read, you know, like there's something about having that that moment of, okay, I have some, that anticipation, right? Even now with binging Netflix or binging a show, we can just watch an entire series, you know, and and we're getting so used to that. Um, I want to tie that back into what you do. And and one of the reasons why I I love following you and following your your commentary, you know, I I just always find your commentary to be so engaging, uh, inspiring and innovative. And it always makes me think while at the same time makes me laugh, you know? Mm. (laughs) And I feel like during this time, we have put such a big focus on, you know, 
having things go by quickly and having things pass quickly, you know, we're so quick to go on to the next thing and now it's the next topic or, um, yeah, like on, on to a next subject when I'm still personally feeling like I'm still reeling from 2020. Like it's still very much something that I'm like, we just lived through a pandemic. Like, mm-hmm. Can we, can we discuss this? So I'm curious for you, what the last two years have been, um, and what your process has been with integrating everything that's happened in the last two years, not just the pandemic. Oh my goodness. The last two years, I mean, for me, so here's the thing is before the pandemic, I was traveling like a hundred thousand miles a year. Oh my God. You know, I was, I'm always on somebody's stage speaking and then I'd go on vacation. I'd go on vacation a couple of times a year, but it was mostly for work, right? I, I'd be traveling mostly for work. And I think for me, this last couple of years gave me an opportunity to sit on my couch, which I frankly loved. I really enjoyed not having to be running, like physically, like I'm running for a flight and I'm about to go to an event and I have to go to another event. I actually did enjoy that piece. Of course, I didn't enjoy the, the, the piece around like the world being on fire, mm-hmm. but the ability for my body to regain stillness, even though I still was busy, like I was never not busy during pandemic. Like I, I still had speaking engagements. They were virtual. I still had, I had to launch my book, Professional Troublemaker in the pandemic. So I had a full seven city virtual tour that has 6,000 people attend, you know? And so for me, I wrote that book in the pandemic. Uh, I think the pandemic was highly productive for me. During a scary time in the world, I think it, that, that whole idea that in times of crisis, artists create their best work, I feel like I did that. Wow. Why do you think that was? Do you think it was because you were forced to slow down? Forced to slow down and inspired to create. Mm. You know, um, I think about my gift as like somebody who uses her words to make impact in the world. And during a pandemic, And I fully affirm the fact that a lot of people did not produce. You had to rest. Some people rested. And I think that's valid too. But some of us felt called to create. And it wasn't like a forced calling. I felt like I wanted to stand in the gap, needed to stand in the gap. I couldn't be quiet as the world was burning. I couldn't just sit and watch it. I also did get some rest, but I feel like I was inspired to just create good art, something to make people feel seen during a time when you can't leave your house. To, I wrote the Fear Fighter Manual, Professional Troublemaker, during a time of intense fear. Mm. And I actually think it gave me great perspective when writing the book because I'm like, yes, this is the time when fear makes sense, right? The fact that those of us who were more fearful were those of us who were more careful, who made, made sure we wore our masks, who made sure we stayed away from like, concerts, you know what I mean? And for a lot of us, it kept us safer, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the the real point about fear is that it was, exp- it was created. It is a feeling that we all need to have mm-hmm. that will keep us safe from psychological danger, physical danger, physiological danger. But the same thing that makes you afraid of going outside during a global pandemic is the same feeling that stops you from saying what needs to be said in the room yeah, or doing the thing that feels difficult. So it actually did give me perspective and allowed me to even write the book with more clarity mm. and urgency and a sense of urgency. Yeah. That, I love that. What was your experience with seeing the divide with the people that were sort of in denial of what exactly was happening in the world? You know, like the people that were out there just like this the pandemic is not real. And I literally have COVID and I'm going to the grocery store like this because I don't believe that this is happening. It drove me nuts. (laughs) Oh my God. It drove me nuts. If I do, if I do like Facebook memories and I see my 2020 and 2021 posts, it's me basically like raging of like, y'all, come on. This is real. This is happening. This is taking lives. This is like breaking families apart. Give it the gravity that it deserves and people being like, it's whatever. I'm going to live my life. It's so funny. I found my Facebook memory from like 
something from like end of February, 2020, where I oh, was wow. saying, I was saying something around like, y'all, this rumor, these rumors that we're hearing about this thing that's happening, I think we should pay attention to it. I, I think this, this might be something serious. It's so funny. My Facebook memories are like these like time capsules of me being, <laughs> being psychic about what's about to go down because I'm like, <laughs> y'all, I'm hoping I'm wrong. Like in the, in the Facebook memory, I'm like, I'm hoping I'm wrong, but I think this is about to be major. And people being like, ah, it's whatever. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. And then seeing it happen. I think it's because we have to start giving credence to what's really happening around us. We are, humans are great at denial Mm. and avoidance. And we activate it, especially in the moments when we shouldn't, like an impending pandemic. Us being like, oh, no, it's fine. We'll be all right. Y'all just overreacting. Same thing with like 2016. When Trump was running, I saw my Facebook memories of me saying, y'all do not take this for granted. Please take this serious because the way people like him would win is if we don't take it serious. And people commenting like, you just bug it anyway. It wouldn't even be that bad. And me going back and being like, wow. So it's interesting. Like I've seen these little moments. I enjoy reading the memories and being like, I be knowing I mean, that is some straight psychic ability that you're able to channel all of those uh, visions, you know, and it's true. You know, I, I was in Bali actually when in the beginning of February Mm. when everything was happening in, um, in China. And I remember being in Bali, I was leading a retreat and I was like, not a care in the world. And I'm like, I'm just going to check online, you know, just to see what's going on. And I was seeing all this news. And I remember emailing my partner, Tori, saying, hey, this thing's happening. President's saying he's going to stop flights from coming to the U.S. I'm supposed to be going to Hong Kong after this. <laughs> like, Should I, do I need to come home? Like, is this no, no, everything's fine. And then, man, when I, it it was not fine. Obviously the news was starting to ramp up, right? So when I came back, lovey, I flew from Bali to Hong Kong. And the minute we got off the airplane, it didn't even pull up to the thing. We came out on the stairs, hazmat suits came out. They're checking the, I mean, straight up from outbreak. It was literally the most traumatic, horrific experience because you're just like, oh my God, like this is happening and I'm so far away from home. Right. And this is like a thing. And I was going through the Hong Kong airport and it was just like desert. It literally was like a scene out of a movie and all the flights are being canceled. And I'm just like, oh my God, I'm not going to make it home. And then by the time I came here, I'm like trying to prepare and I'm telling everybody, Mm. no, you guys don't understand. This is like a thing. This is a big problem. It's already here. I think we need to just be prepared. And everybody was like, oh, it's going to be fine. It's just a flu. And I'm like, bro, let me tell you something. (laughs) Over a million people later lost their lives. Yeah. Here we are being like, ah. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. Seriously. No. Like, I think, again, we, we just tend to, we don't do enough to care for each other as people as a species as entities we don't do enough we don't operate with urgency yeah in doing what needs to be done why do you think why do you think that is and what do you think we can do to make it better because it does seem like we are very cut off from the people that don't have our point of view i think we need to just start living in reality (laughs) you know like when scientists are telling you something it's probably in our best interest to listen. Like the fact that we, we argue scientists who spend years researching something, they know this thing and they are flagging it and we go, ah, you're crazy. Meanwhile, this is their specialty. I think just logically listening to the people who know more than we do is a value add just in any area of our lives, you know, trusting the people who know more than we do about a particular thing. I am not a scientist. I would never argue with the scientists about something that they've studied and researched and got degrees in because I've watched a YouTube video. Right. And there was a lot of that. 
I have rants from the, that point to where I'm like, y'all are driving me insane. But I just really do think that we need to start being better. We need to just be better. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And it actually brings me back to your book and writing this book during the time where it was, there was so much fear. People had Mm -hmm. so much fear and there was a lot of things going on. Then, you know, the death of George Floyd, then we saw the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. It was all the same. There was just so much visceral emotion going on. And in a way it's like, I think about it too, you know, it's the things that we see collectively, not things that we know go on for forever, right? Mm-hmm. It's when we all see something, then it becomes uh, a hot topic, right? For us to be able to talk about. Yeah. Um, I I think about what it means to be somebody that's has a desire to elevate people. And, and I know that you say, the troublemaker sort of avatar is an opportunity for people to speak up and to be able to elevate a conversation, elevate a way of thinking, change a perspective. So can you speak a little bit more on that, on what that means to you and what your desire is for people that read your work? Yeah. You know, I think about a professional troublemaker as somebody who's a disruptor for good. Right. They're the person who's speaking up in the room and challenging the terrible campaign idea at work. They're the ones who might, you know, tell your uncle that the inappropriate joke is not okay. You know, they're the friend who is always ready to have a tough conversation to grow from. And I think they're ultimately people who know that, yes, you're going to be afraid of things, but it's more significant to do the thing than to give into the fear. You know, it's the idea that fearlessness is not that you're not afraid, it's that you are afraid and you do it anyway. You're not letting your fear make you do less. And I think about, you know, this world that we live in when we look around and we go like, oh my gosh, like, how did things end up the way they are? It's from not it's from a lot of people shirking the responsibility to do what they need to do to make this world better than they found it. You know, it's a lot of people who stay quiet when they should be saying something. A lot of people who have the power to stop something that's not okay from happening, but they let it happen because they say, it's not my responsibility. It's not my business. Mm. You know? So yeah, when we look up and realize that now we're denying science and it's because we've made a habit out of being daft. Like we're culturally daft. (laughs) Just we deny what makes sense. We deny what there's proof about just simply because we don't want to accept and deal with the fact that we have to fix and play cleanup. And then we look up and go, why is everybody terrible? Why is everything terrible? We've all let it get terrible. And some of us are trying to fix what we can in the different rooms that we are in. And ultimately, that's what matters is that, like, find a way to fix things that are in the rooms that you're in. It's not about social media. It's not about whether you're donating $40,000 to a nonprofit. Are you donating your time to a local nonprofit? Are you speaking up and challenging the ideas that are happening around you from the people who know and love you? Are you actively using your voice for somebody who's not typically given a platform to have a voice? How are you using your access and your privilege for the betterment of somebody else who does not look or sound like you? All of those things come into play. And I think professional troublemakers are people who are constantly thinking about that. You know, I think about the late, great John Lewis, who was like, always be ready to make good trouble, necessary trouble. I think necessary trouble is what we all need to commit ourselves to. Founded in 2009 by top scientists from acclaimed universities in the fields of aging, genetics, and biology, Insight Tracker is a truly personalized nutrition and performance system. And it's been the only system that I've used to help improve my metabolism. You'll get a daily action plan with personalized guidance on the right exercise, nutrition, and supplementation for your body. You can also add Inner Age 2.0 to any plan for a definitive calculation of your true biological age to see how you're aging from the inside out. And for a limited time for all of our Radically Loved listeners, you can get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com forward slash loved. That's insidetracker.com forward slash 
loved to get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. InsideTracker.com forward slash loved. How do we find the balance between creating that being a, a professional troublemaker and also at the same time be kind and compassionate? Because a lot of the times people might think, oh, to be a troublemaker, it means that I have to be, I don't know, mean or whatever, you know, in a certain way. I don't see it like that, but I'm just, I'm being the devil's advocate. Yeah. You know what I I'm think- saying? I think um, people think about troublemaking as like, you know, throwing bombs in a room and walking away. No. Yeah. You can be thoughtful about being challenging. You can be thoughtful about dissenting. And um, it's not even about being mean. And to be quite honest, people will consider you mean if they feel like it. Right. right. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you say. It's right. It does, not, it, it does not matter. If you disagree with somebody, even if you disagree in the best way, sometimes people will be like, she's mean. How? She didn't cuss you out. What's the problem? But I do think you can be thoughtful, you know, check yourself and make sure it's coming from a place of love. Say it properly and, you know, say it in the best way you know how. You know, the troublemaking of it all is not just about making people upset. And actually, that's never the intention. The intention is that you honor yourself and you honor your values and you honor the room that you are in by making sure that you will be proud of anything that happens in it. Because mm. if you walk out the room and somebody goes, wait, that idea came out that room, you were there? What did you say? Did you like it? And you go, well, no, I didn't like it. Well, did you say anything? And you go, well, no. The question is, I always ask myself, like, will my silence convict me? Like, will my inaction make me proud? Will my silence convict me? Because I'm the one who has to now honor myself. So we spend a lot of time betraying ourselves by biting our tongues when we really need to speak up. We spend a lot of time betraying ourselves by allowing people to convince us that we need to be different from who we are. You know, so all of that is what troublemaking entails. It's not just you disagreeing with somebody. Yeah. It's doubling down on honoring yourself. Yeah, no, I love that. I feel like for people that didn't have that, edge or that confidence when they were young, Mm -hmm. how do they develop that as an adult? You know, I I always say for for myself, I can relate to it. You know, when somebody says, how did you end up being this kid that got in trouble with the law and whatever, you know, I'm like, well, it started with small acts of defiance, right? Like just those little (laughs) moments of... I don't agree with this, or I'm going to get kicked out of catechism because I just questioned our teacher and our the nun that was saying, no, this really happened. And it's like, no, ma'am, I didn't see God's hand come down. I didn't actually mm. see it. So I'm not going to lie on, in the house of God saying that I saw something when I didn't really see, right? So, mm. but those moments, I think for me, just help train me to be able to speak up or say something and, and feel like this is the right thing to do. Exactly as you were saying, I love the description. So what about for the people that don't feel like they have that voice within them, like they can say something or they've been quieted their entire life to say that their voice doesn't matter? Well, I think about truth telling and troublemaking, not like it's not a personality trait. You know, it's not that like some people were born with it and then some people don't have it. I feel like it's a commitment. It's like a habit that you've that you say, I am going to take on. You know, I think every moment is an opportunity that you can choose to say, you know, I'm going to do that. And I think that's powerful. I think it's incredibly powerful to make the choice to be courageous, to make the choice to make the trouble when you could choose otherwise, when silence is more comfortable. Mm. So it literally is a habit that you form. It's a moment by moment decision that you make. And we can all start anytime we want. You know, if you're typically the reserved person who doesn't say anything, in the next meeting, somebody says something that really was offensive, you can decide right then and there, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually wield my voice. Um, and that's important to know because some people think it's somehow out of their skill set mm-hmm. or like their personality box. And I'm just like, no, it's not a personality trait. It's, it's a habit that a lot of people can can develop when you're being intentional. 
a lot of us haven't just been intentional about it. We can be intentional starting now. Yeah. No, I really love that. You say that truth telling is a skill, being able to stand into the power of your own words, how important that is for all of us to do. I'm curious for you, what does that what does that look like and feel like when that moment before you know you need to say something? Like is it a feeling? Is it an energy? Does it is it just so much of a habit now that it just comes out naturally? Or is there a process that you go through? Well, I will typically ask myself three questions of like, do I mean it? Can I defend it? And I can can I say it thoughtfully? And I try to use that as a checkpoint for myself uh, for that right before that moment when I'm about to say something to make sure that I'm coming from a place of honor and a place of good vibes. You know, it's not just about me wanting to hear my voice or it's not about me being a contrarian. It's about really understanding that what I'm about to say, I can stand in it and I can defend it if I'm challenged on it. Um, and it, sometimes it's scary, you know, and I think that's important to always talk about is like, mm-hmm. It's not like you'll just stop being afraid of the tough moments where you have to speak up. You just end up going, I'm not going to let the fear be what dictates my decision here. Like, I won't let the fear be the thing that sits on my shoulders that makes me not regret not using my voice. Mm. So I'm just very quick with acknowledging that I'm afraid about it. I'm anxious about it. I might be doubtful about it, but I have to do it anyway. So I do like quick, probably a five second (laughs) check in my head that's like, so you want to say, can, do you mean it? Do you def- can you defend it? Can you say it thoughtfully? I bet. And then sometimes I will ask myself that question of like, will my silence convict me? But it sometimes can feel scary because you're like, am I going to be on an island by myself again? Mm. Am I going to ruffle certain feathers again? And, you know, that stuff can make us shut up real quick. Yeah. I think I'd just be like, all right. Because if you walk out this room and you beat yourself up for not saying that thing, then you should have said it. How do you resolve that part of you that I think we all have, that we don't want to be exiled, right? We don't want to be kicked off the island. Or are you just in a position in your career, in your life, where you just don't care? I mean, I think all humans want community. Like, we all, none of us want to be ostracized from the rooms that we are in. But I think it's one of those things where I don't even think about it as, as being ostracized. If I say one thing and it ostracizes me from a room, that wasn't a room for me anyway. If me thoughtfully challenging something has me cut off, that was not the space for me anyway. So I'm like, if me honestly showing up as my best self and looking out for your best interests offends you to the point where you remove me from the room, then this absolutely is not the space for me to spend that energy, my energy. And it's a data point. So... I think it just needs to be done. And and also rejecting the constant people pleasing that stops us from honoring ourselves is a lifelong journey that everybody needs to go on, I think. Because it's like, otherwise, all your decisions are going to be motivated by either pissing somebody, not avoiding pissing somebody off or making somebody else happy. Meanwhile, you haven't done the thing that makes you most happy, in which you look back and you go, why did I do that? Yeah, I love that. What is your spiritual anchor point if you have a spiritual practice? Um, I don't think I have a practice that's like routine, but I'm a Christian. Um, My faith is important to me. I will say prayers um, to feel anchored. I wear a chain with a cross on it. That's like my security blanket. Um... Yeah, I think, honestly, I think I try to live my life in a way that I know will honor God. Um, And I do that by honestly just using my gifts, giving my gifts away, uh, honoring why I was brought here. I think that in itself is a spiritual practice. Like, I'm really proud of the work that I've done, about the way that I show up in the world, about the person that I am. And I feel like that in itself is a spiritual practice, being able to be proud of who I am. And who God created me to be, I think that's a bit of a spiritual practice. So I just, yeah. you know, I say some, I say my my nightly prayers. I, but I, but but I think first and foremost is I try to be a decent person, a really good person. Mm. I feel like a lot of people need to anchor into that more. 
especially now. Yeah. You you pour so much of yourself into everybody, your followers, the people that come to your talks, the people that follow you, you know, all, all of your your people. How do you fill your own cup? I disappear from people. Um, I do. That is how I fill my cup is I disappear from peopling. I go, you know what? I'm not peopling right now. <laughs> and I go recharge my batteries. Like I, I don't answer phone calls. I, I go sit by myself for seven days and recharge. Cause yeah, I am actually, I'm an introvert. Yeah. So when I am interacting with people, I'm giving away my energy. I don't receive my energy from other people. I'm giving people my energy. So how I refill my cup is I go recharge by myself. I talk to my therapist. I hang with my friends. I don't recharge by going to parties. That's not how I, mm -mm. a party is going to drain my batteries. You know, when I get off a stage, I'm like, oh, let me just take some time for myself. And I think that's important. Yeah, I love that. I I can definitely get on board with that, especially now, right after having a book come out. It's the first time I've ever done it and doing the entire interviews and all of the mm -hmm. stuff. It's just, I finally got to a point. I'm like, wow, this is, I don't think this is for me. I mean, this is, this is intense. You know, this is a lot of, you know, there are certain people that thrive in that. And I do love to share and I do love to speak, but I'm the same way. I need to be able to just disconnect and just stop, stop all of it for a while. I'm, I go back to that person that loves to go into the library and loves to sit right back to my little city. I go and I read no electronics anywhere. I'm just, I have to go into that space of remembering why I'm doing what I'm doing. So it sounds like you, you do the same thing. Yep. So I have one final uh, question to ask you. Um, it might be a two part. We'll see how it goes. Um, before I let you go, where can people go to find you for more information? I am on the interwebs at Lovey Everywhere. One <laughs> username, L-U-V-V-I-E. And um, that's where I, you know, I'm, I'm showing up most days to, to talk about how I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, how I see the world. And um, my podcast, Professional Troublemaker, where I'm in conversation with people who I think are disruptors and trailblazers. Yeah, that's great. So we'll put the show note, we'll put that all in the show notes. So if you're watching this on YouTube, it'll be in the description below. If you're listening to this, wherever you get your podcast, it'll be in the info button, wherever you are listening to this from. So the final question is with regard to this podcast and why I started the podcast. The idea is that we are radically loved and supported by God. I say God. You can say universe, source, whatever higher power of your understanding that the universe works for us and not against us. And the idea mm. is that we are radically loved and supported. Those were the anchor points that got me from where I started to where I am now. So the final question to you, Lovey, is how do you feel radically loved? Mm. Ooh, I feel radically loved by the people in my life. You know, they show up for me in ways that always brings me to tears and blows me away. And I'm always like, wow, I am genuinely loved in this world. So like people just honestly just showing up for me, whether they're knocking on my door or being like, hey, you need a ride somewhere or, you know, I booked you a trip or here's a massage. So my husband, my friends, my mentors, they, they show me radical love. And I'm, it, it, it really is what makes me revel in gratitude. Wow. Oh, I love that. Who do you radically love? Mm, those same people. I hope that I show them radical love by showing up in the way they do for me too. And even beyond it, you know, when they're not thinking about anything, they'll get a care package from me. And they'll be like, oh my gosh, I needed this. I'm, I'm the queen of care packages. I love sending my friends care packages. So just because care packages, not just on their birthdays. In fact, what's funny is I'm the friend who might actually miss your birthday. Like I might forget to call you on your birthday, but then like three months 
will pass and we'll have nothing to celebrate. And you just randomly see a care package for me. <laughs> so it's like, you're being celebrated enough on your birthday. You're fine. You don't, you don't necessarily need me. It's when you are having a bad day and nobody's thinking about you. You, you'll see me show up. Mm, oh, I love that. I love that. I think that's so beautiful. Lovey, thank you so, so much. You really are a true gem. And uh, I'm grateful to know you and to have had you on the show and to just have been following you for as long as I have. And the listeners here know you and they know your work. The name of the book is called Professional Troublemaker, The Fear Fighter Manual. And um, you should also check out I'm Judging You. And I know that you're working on a another book for teens right now. So Rising Troublemaker is actually out now. May 17th is when it's out everywhere. So you can get it everywhere. Books are sold anywhere. Like grab one. It's, it's an amazing graduation gift for um, anybody in high school or even middle school. I, I wrote this book with 12 to 19 year olds in mind. Because oh, wow, I really think they need to get this early and hear it often. So yeah, go get this book for your kids, Rising Troublemaker, a Fear Fighter Manual for Teens. Yeah, that's great. So all of you listening, all you parents out there, I know we have a large parental demographic. So please get this book for your teens. They need it right now. They need so much support and we're here for you. So thank you all so much, Lovey. Thank you again so much for all of you, everything that you do for being amazing and just being such an innovator in the space and for being so inspiring. Thank you for taking care of yourself too, because we need to have our Lovey in our lives. So <laughs> thank you. So thank you for that. And um, thank you all so much for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts and share this with a friend. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast, and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie, on Instagram at Rosie Acosta, and Twitter at Rosie Acosta. By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com.